In this video, I'm going to talk about the importance of reading in terms of improving your overall level of English. I'm going to talk briefly about why I think reading is important, but then I'm going to give you a couple of tips on how I think you can make reading in English a little bit more enjoyable, or at least a little bit more accessible. And then I'm going to give you some recommendations. I'm going to talk about five books that I think you might want to have a go at reading in English. And then I'm going to take you through three websites that are freely accessible that you might want to check out as well. Now, this is YouTube, so it'd be great if you were to hit the subscribe button. But other than that, let's just get into it. I think the ultimate goal of most learners of English is to be able to express themselves fluently in a conversation with native speakers. But before that can happen, the student has to be able to both understand what the other person is saying to them, and they also need to have a vocabulary large enough in order to be able to express themselves. Now, listening and reading can both play a big part in preparing a student to be able to hold a fluent conversation. Listening because it's really important to be used to the intonations and the rhythm of the language. Now, even if you're not understanding every word that I'm saying, you're getting used to the sounds of English simply by listening to this video and hearing what I'm saying. However, we're going at my speed at the moment. You can't control what's happening right now. Whereas with reading, you can. There you get an opportunity to slow things down, focus on the grammar, focus on the vocabulary, and go at your own pace. And this is why reading is so important. And I think reading is a way in which you can expand your vocabulary much more easily than when you're simply listening to someone because you have the opportunity to look at a word that you haven't seen before, see if you can identify what it might mean simply from its context, or then simply look it up in a, in a dictionary. But reading gives you the opportunity to really expand your vocabulary, hopefully in a way that is much more entertaining than simply trying to memorize lists of words. And this brings me on to my first tip for you. I think using e-readers and tablets for reading in a foreign language or for reading in English in this case is really useful. And I'll tell you why. It's because you can put a dictionary on these devices so that you can instantly look up a word without either having to slow down or to have to carry around with you a dictionary, a second book. I get it that many people still prefer reading real paper books. However, for a language learner, the benefit of simply being able to put a finger on a word to find out what it means and then carry on reading without interrupting their flow, I think is absolutely invaluable. Now, what should you read? Well, my answer to this question is whatever you want to read. If you want to read thrillers, read thrillers. If you like biographies, read biographies. If you like science books, read about science. It's hard enough learning a language without also having to read stuff that you're not interested in. So make it as easy as you can for yourself. The longer you spend immersed in the English language and reading, the better. So it really doesn't matter what it is that you're reading, just that you have the motivation to keep reading in English. That's the most important thing. However, if you can't think of anything, if nothing immediately springs to mind that you'd like to start reading, I've got five recommendations for you. So here we go. I'm going to start with Lord of the Flies by William Golding. Now, this was a book written in the middle part of the 20th century, and it's considered a modern classic. It's about a group of young boys who are stranded on an island without any adult supervision, 
and how their behaviour descends into tribal violence. Now, it may sound terrible, but it is a classic. And it's also something that all British students of English have to study when they're at about 15 or 16 years old. It's a very simply written book. The prose is very easy to understand and it's not too long. So it's a modern English classic, Lord of the Flies by William Golding. Next on my list of uh, recommendations would be Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie. Now I'd recommend this for a number of reasons. Not least is the fact that you've probably already got an idea of what the plot is. You might have seen a movie adaptation, for example, and that's going to certainly help you when you're reading it in terms of visualising what's going on. Again, like Lord of the Flies, it's not a particularly long book, and Agatha Christie's really good at quickly painting portraits of all of her characters. So it's a good, fun book to read, a little bit claustrophobic. There's a murder on a train, obviously, but I can certainly recommend it. So Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie. The next thing I want to recommend is 1984 by George Orwell. Now, Orwell is an interesting writer because he has quite complicated themes, but his prose style, the style in which he actually writes, is really clear, really easy to understand, and excellent for learners of English. And in 1984, there's some classic ideas of his that you're going to read about, Big Brother, Room 101, and Double Speak. So although the book itself is quite dark in its themes, it's incredibly well written. Again, not too long and a rewarding read. I can certainly recommend it. That's 1984 by George Orwell. If you'd like to try a modern thriller, I can really recommend The Girl on the Train by Paula Hawkins. It's obviously been incredibly successful and they've made a movie, but it's also an incredibly well-written book. It's well written in the sense that narratively it's been crafted very well. As the reader, you only understand what's truly happening as the narrator begins to understand what's happening. But also the author, Paula Hawkins, paints a really vivid and, in my view, accurate portrait of modern Britain. So I can really recommend that. The Girl on the Train by Paula Hawkins. Now, if fiction isn't your thing and you'd like to read some non-fiction, you could do a lot worse than reading Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. Sapiens is the history of humankind, starting really at the year zero and going through modern times and off into the future, imagining how we might evolve as a species. Now, whilst the themes in the book are quite complicated, the prose style, the way in which he writes, are very straightforward and easy to understand. So it's a big book and it's a rewarding book, but I think that it's something that a student of English could certainly have a go at reading. So that's Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. Now you may be thinking, oh, I'm not sure that I've got the confidence or even the time to try reading an entire book. Well, in that case, why not just dip in and out of news websites? And what I'm going to do now is show you three websites that are completely free that you can dip in and out of whenever you choose. So let's start with the BBC at bbc.com and this is their homepage. And if we scroll down very briefly, we'll see that there's absolutely piles of stuff here. It's quite easy to get lost. So what I recommend that you do when you first come to the BBC page is to go to their news tab here in the bar along the top of the screen. Hit that. And then if we scroll down a little bit, we find the most read stories of the day and they put 10 most read stories here. So for example, we could click on number nine, French Alps helicopter kills five. And then obviously they've presented the story to us. Now you'll notice here that this article isn't particularly long and this is typical of the way the BBC present their news stories. They're actually quite easy to read. However, there's far more to the BBC website than simply news. So if we go back to the home page, 
what I'd recommend that you do is scroll across here to the culture tab. So if we click on culture, here we've got all sorts of things. And the first thing that we come across is a story about how rural bliss became a modern fantasy. And this is all about people wanting to move out from the, from the cities into countryside environments and live in cute cottages like this. Now here, the language is much richer, there's far more adjectives, it's going to be a little bit more difficult to read, but possibly a bit more rewarding as well. And this is a much longer piece than you'd find in the news section. So if you can find something in the culture section that interests you, then all to the good. Next site I want to show you is The Guardian at theguardian.com. And here's their homepage. And again, what I'd recommend that you do is just scroll your way down to the bottom of it. And again, you're going to be able to find out what other people are reading right now. And they call it, let's just get down there, they call it most viewed. So at the moment on The Guardian, most people are looking at this story about coronavirus live news and Merkel is apparently furious. Um, but there's all sorts of other things that you could read on there. Um, an article that catches my eye is um, number five, where a dancer in Berlin, a black dancer in Berlin, is um, accusing her company of racism. So if we click on that and take a look at the story, this is a typical Guardian presentation of a story with um, an emphasis on classic photography. And you'll also notice, compared with the BBC, that the articles tend to be a lot longer and they tend to use a lot more academic language as well. So if you really want to push yourself a little bit more, especially when you're reading news stories, you're probably going to find the, that the Guardian is a more challenging read than the BBC. But let's go back to the top, because just like the BBC, there is a culture and lifestyle section in The Guardian, and I recommend that you take a look at that as well, um, particularly the lifestyle section. So if we click on it, we will find absolutely all sorts of dis different types of content here. So there's something about social media, when to unfriend, I just got so sick of seeing these stupid opinions on my feed, then sexual healing. My partner and I haven't had sex for two years. How can I tackle my issues with intimacy? But if we go back to the previous lifestyle page, we'll notice that it covers all sorts of things. There's coronavirus in there. There's fashion. There's food. If you think that the English have got anything to teach you about food, that is. Um, health and well-being, relationships, travel, and so on. There is a wealth of material here that you, you can find. Now, the last site I'm going to show you is at dailymail.co.uk. Now, the Daily Mail is probably Britain's biggest selling newspaper. It's incredibly popular. However, you'll notice, compared with the BBC and The Guardian, the layout of their website is a complete mess. We've got adverts everywhere and video pop-ups. So I'm going to try and close that so we can see what we're doing. And also, the layout of the stories is a, is a mess. So we've got stuff about European politics and COVID, jumping straight into a story here about replacing your boiler. That's your heater system at home. So the layout is absolutely all over the place. However, it's possibly worth your time trying to read some of these articles because they use a much more idiomatic form of English, uh, a much more day-to-day -day form of the language. So they could be really useful for you to take a look at this. Um, so the news stories are arranged down the left-hand side of the page. And on the right, there is this column here, which is basically about personal interest stories. Some people call this the sidebar of shame, because in much of these stories here, it's simply an excuse to put photographs of people wearing swimwear. However, if you want to get an idea of the sort of language used in a popular British newspaper, there's no better place to go than dailymail.co.uk. 
I just want to finish by reiterating how important I think reading is. I think it's by far the easiest and hopefully most entertaining way to expand your vocabulary in English. And this can only help your conversational and your written skills as well. Now, when it comes to the recommendations I've given you, you can ignore all of them or you can try all of them. It doesn't matter. What's most important is that you read something that you want to read because you've got to find your own motivation. And the more time you spend immersed in English, the more fluent you're ultimately going to become in the language. So that's it for this video. Hope to catch you on the next one. Take care.